Well, we're going to order the presentation, order the program. Thank you. So it starts with a mystery. Uh, for those of us who do some research back into public policy and uh, vocational uh, education history, agricultural education history, occasionally you run across uh, mysteries. And one of the mysteries that I found was uh, actually on the board one statement made by a formerly enslaved person in 1862 South uh, Carolina who lived in an area where they were beginning to do educational efforts for formerly enslaved people. And he said, those Yankees preach nothing but cop. Cop! And I'm wondering what exactly uh, he was talking about. I've done some work recently on a, uh, on a school called the Penn School, which is now known as the Penn Center. It's located on St. Helena Island, just, uh, uh, just a little ways from Hilton Head, South Carolina. Some of you may be familiar with that in Beaufort, South Carolina. Uh, it was, uh, as far as I can determine, if not the first school, one of the first schools for formerly enslaved people in the American South in that time period. It began uh, in the spring of 1862. There's a picture of the Greek church where they held early classes at. That Greek church is still standing and still being used, as a matter of fact, and it was built in 1850. And over on the other side, you can see one of the, the teachers of the school there, uh, Laura Town. Her and her partner, Ellen Murray, came down from the north. Uh, they were missionaries. They came down to build and open the school. And not only did they provide schooling and training, but they taught agricultural subjects. They, they, uh, performed, <laughs> they, they took care of medical issues. Uh, whatever the community needed, they were a full service at school uh, there. Uh, in 1901, Hampton Institute took over a responsibility for the school, Hampton Institute in Virginia, and it became a normal and industrial school, which just simply means that they provided uh, vocational training for uh, students uh, as part of their educational experience and also trained teachers. So uh, that's a little bit about it, but my question is this. I thought about the timing of it. Here's the first uh, official school there, uh, there on the other side of there, uh, located just off the road from Frogmore, South Carolina. But we're talking about a school that started in 1862. If you know your history, you know that uh, Fort Sumter fell in 1861. I believe the war started in April 1861. And this school was built about a 20-minute airplane ride south from Charleston in the spring of 1862, less than a year later. And you go, what? That's enemy territory. How do you build a school for formerly enslaved people? What do you mean they're formerly enslaved in South Carolina in 1862? What do you mean there's a school for them? And what do you mean by formerly enslaved? So that's a question that I've been working on for a, a, a little bit of time. But in other work that I do, I teach a global issues class, and we're looking at cotton production in the United States, and I came across this particular statistic, which is the second mystery. In 1830, the United States was producing around 341 million pounds of cotton, which is about half of the world's production. Ten years later, as you can see there, 854 pounds and then uh, 1850, 1 billion pounds. And then look at 1860, about a year before the American Civil War began, we were producing 2.3 billion pounds of cotton. Now, those of you who studied something about how plantations work in the South, we were really good in the South. I'm from the South. We were really good about wearing the land out. We were really good at soil fertility, uh, protecting our soil, providing for what was needed there, so a lot of people would just grow cotton, and then when the land wouldn't support and the production, they would get more acreage, grow more cotton, county line to county line, fence row to fence row, they just moved on and planted more and planted more and didn't worry as much about productivity measures, fertility and such. So that's the case. How in the world did cotton production continue to rise as it did in the American South? It exploded. It's, ex it's exponential. It's hard to believe that amount. So I, that's the second mystery. Now what you may all know is that the South, of course, depended upon cotton as a, as a crop, but the North depended upon it as a textile. The South had to sell cotton to somebody. So Northern merchants really wanted that cotton. They wanted it badly. 
because they could convert it into textiles. And if nothing else, they could pick it up and they could ship it over to Great Britain and Europe where the Industrial Revolution had exploded. And textiles were going to the roof in Europe and they needed all the cotton they could lay their hands on. So they really liked Southern cotton. Nobody was really, if you ask me, nobody was really asking a lot of questions about how it was produced. They just wanted the cotton. So how did it continue to increase? That's the question. When we like adequate soil fertility measures, we, uh, we had trouble with our uh, farm. We needed extension agents in 1850s <laughs> south. So that actually led me to the project which ties the two together, the two questions together. And you can see what I'm looking at here. We're not going to talk much about the Penn School today. That's another paper for another time. What I'd like to discuss is how we got the Penn School, how school opened for formerly enslaved people in an occupied territory three years before the end of the American Civil War, and why that's important. And of course, as part of the uh, methodology, these are some of the resources that I look for. Um, it involved a good amount of road time, as you can see. Uh, the Buford County Library Archives are extremely helpful. On-site visits to St. Helena Island, which is a beautiful territory, by the way. All the Penn School papers are at UNC Chapel Hill. So, of course, reading all that material, uh, subjecting it to uh, source criticism, triangulating it, making sure it was accurate, and then trying to put together a narrative that makes sense. Hopefully it will in the next few minutes we have. And by the way, I think this is probably about a 40-minute presentation, but we're going to stop at 15, okay? So what you're looking at is probably the engine of um, enterprise in the South. If you want to know why cotton production continued to go up in the American South during the early 1800s in spite of poor soil characteristics and, well, bad management in that regard. It has to do with people who are who were um, brought over here and told to get to work against their will. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of a slave family on the Smith uh, plantation uh, in uh, prior to 1860. If you're old enough to walk, you're old enough to work. And so under a system called the task system and the factory system, that is what drove the production of cotton in the South, particularly. Now, I mentioned the task system, okay? Now, I, I don't know how to say this anyway. I, I say I talk plainly sometimes, so maybe a little bit too plainly, but I'm going to say it as best I can. The reason why cotton production went up was because we had people that we could beat to within an inch of their life if they did not produce and did not bring in their quota every day. And there is physical evidence of this. Um, overseers would say, if you didn't bring in your 100 pounds today, you'd get a beating. It didn't matter if you were male, it didn't matter if you were female, it didn't matter if you were pregnant, you get a whipping while you're holding your child in your arms, it didn't matter. So when you, when you put that kind of pressure on people to produce, well, they did. Historically, they did, and they will. Um, enslaved people who didn't meet their production quotas on a daily basis got this kind of treatment. And then, uh, you know, there are four different there are four pieces or elements of farming. There's land, labor, capital, and management. We've talked about land. We've talked about labor. Overseers management, we haven't talked much about it. But let's talk about capital for a moment. If you have to be able to buy more land to grow more cotton, if your cotton production has decreased and you need more land to grow it, remember you don't have much cotton, so you don't have much capital, but you need land. So you have to have some way to borrow money. But you can't borrow on a crop that isn't there. You can't hardly borrow on land that isn't worth that money. But you can borrow on the people that you've got working on your, your place. This is where farmers got their capital, the operating capital. Over here is Mary on the uh, Pleasant Hill Plantation in South Carolina in 1850 at the end of the year. Mary was worth $900, bad value $900, 34 year old female slave. Over on the other side, you've got Sandy, a male slave. He's 38 years old. And at the end of the year, he's worth $800. Growers, farmers, plantation owners, 
could borrow against the value of the humans working on their plantations. And that's how they were able to expand the cotton market. Now this happened for half a century, by the way, and longer. And you know, cotton was being shipped north, and this shouldn't be a surprise to people who live in the uh, American North during this period of time. Now one is actually a little bit more depressing if I can show you this. Uh, these records came out of the South Carolina Historical Archives. Down here we've got little Rose. Rose is six months old. At the end of the year, uh, her plantation owner valued Rose at $100. A six-month-old human being is worth $100. And if the plantation owner needed that $100 to buy more land or more seed or more fertilizer or whatever, new mule, he could borrow money against Rose. Isn't that something? You can see that. This is all available to you, and uh, after, after we're offline, I can show you how to get to some of this information. It's freely available to you. But in 1861, the United States Navy showed up at Port Royal, Beaufort, near St. Helena Island. November 7, 1861, they took Beaufort. They got that area, and when the Navy and the Federal Army showed up, it ran off all the plantation owners and in this particular area. Um, just uh, about the middle of the picture is what we're talking about. The Sea Islands produced sea island cotton. It was really wanted. And uh, it was a really valuable type of crop. So um, we had to find some way. The feds had, had thought this thing through. Let me just say it this way. Just about the same time the Federal Army moved through and pushed the Confederate Army out of the Buford region. And the plantation owners left. They took off. Uh, these things uh, began to happen. Salmon Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury. He sent federal agents down to collect as much cotton as they could find. The North needed cotton. The Civil War had cut off the cotton supply. They needed as much as they could get. So almost before the gunfire had stopped, agents were there collecting it and shipping it north. There was a problem, though. There were around, this comes from a report, there were around 200 plantations in that particular area. And we know who was left behind. This photograph was taken about two months after the federal occupation of Buford and St. Helena Island. Approximately, uh, the best figures I can find, around 12,000 formerly enslaved people were there. They had no, uh, the only people left were maybe some of their drivers and overseers who were there to help them kind of manage things. But the Federal Army now had 12,000 refugees on their hands to figure out what to do with while they're trying to fight a war. So, and this is a little bit more about the problem. The 1862 cotton crop wasn't going in because there was nobody there in the region of the planet. All the plantation owners and overseers had taken off. The only people left were the formerly enslaved people. The Army didn't really want to deal with formerly enslaved people. They're busy fighting the war. Now they've got to pull 12,000 people along with the Army. They weren't ready for that. The formerly enslaved people were thrilled to be over with, with slavery, but they had to have something to eat. And all of the mechanisms for, for, for what their life went away. And now they're all responsible for raising their own food, taking care of themselves and all of that. They were really interested in planting some food crops. The last thing on our mind was cotton. But the North needed it. The North needed it to fund the war, to keep the engine of commerce going in the northern states. It was needed. So that, but they didn't know how to grow it. So the federal agents came down and they began to work on it. And they came up with something called the Fort Royal Experiment. I've got to come around here to see what I'm Thank you. Four world experiment says we're going to restart production of cotton in the region. We're going to keep these people moving. We're going to provide schools for formerly enslaved people. We're going to bring them in as full and productive citizens of the United States. So we're going to build schools here. They appointed superintendents to run the plantations. They hired back formerly enslaved people, paid them a small wage to raise the cotton crop, and it kind of went in that direction. They brought down Christian missionaries, and teachers to open the schools. Those schools were not paid for by the federal government. They were supported by the federal government. You could have schools, but were not paid for it. These were all paid for through philanthropic means. 
But the last thing I'll leave you with, because my time is up, is this. This is in the report, and I think it's important to know. This gives you an idea of what you can sell. People's way of thinking. Edward Pierce was a government agent. Formerly enslaved people had no greater friend than him in that it reaches during that time. But even in his report to Secretary Chase, he wrote this. The laborers themselves are no longer slaves. They're not prepared for privileges of citizenship. There's no effort uh, to uh, be spared for the work that makes them better. But if they won't do, if they won't perform, we have to punish them. Send them to prison, poorhouse, reduce their privileges. So, in no sense, in a way to rescue people, we ended up putting them back in a very similar situation to what they were just leaving. And our time is up. Maybe we can handle some of the other slides and questions. Dr. Roberts? Yeah. So, I'm assigned to discuss it, which simply means that I'm going to ask you for your questions rather than my discuss this. What questions do you have of Dr. Kramer? about the pen school and about the world of cotton. Yeah. Well, mine is a bit tangentially related to the questions. But Texas, South Carolina, North Carolina, if you were born in this country, 
What do you have to do to be a citizen? None. You're a citizen already, right? Well, what we essentially told at the end of the American Civil War is that four million people, a lot of whom were born here, was that they now had to do something to earn their place here. So we're going to send them to school. We're going to teach them our way of doing things. We're going to teach schools without regard for your previous culture, your history. Uh, we're going to teach you things that, that we think you need to know to live here. We forget about your old life. We're going to make you ready to live here. And I got to say that this part, really, that part of this study disturbs me a good bit. Um, but I am working continually on some work on the Penn School, and this paper, or this presentation, was simply to get us to the point where the Penn School even got there. It was economic. It was about economics more than anything else. Carson, I'm over time. Uh, yeah, fifty seconds. Uh, thanks. <laughs>